We as a society need to move forward. We're all in it together. We need to show solidarity because we're all responsible. Problem is, when everyone's responsible for something, then no one's responsible for it. So what's the solution? Individual responsibility. Individualism. But what exactly does that mean? What would Hayek say? I'm Scott Nelson with the Austrian Economic Center and Hayek Institute in Vienna, Austria. And this week, we're going to have a look at what Hayek has to say about individualism. Now, individualism doesn't always have a great name these days. Some people see it as inherently against community and, and society. Some people think that individualism is fundamentally a glorification of selfishness of the worst kind. And still others think that individualism weakens the foundations of virtue by teaching people to place the satisfaction of their base desires above the pursuit of moral excellence. So the criticisms come from both left and right, you see. Now, Hayek deals with these criticisms and lays the foundations for much of his later thought in a famous essay called Individualism, True and False. This essay, retitled as The Humility of Individualism, would have been the introductory chapter to a great project that Hayek began working on in the early 1940s, but uh, that he unfortunately never realized, namely his book on the abuse and decline of reason. Now, in this essay, Individualism, True and False, Hayek contrasts two types of individualism, as the title would suggest. Two types of individualism, two outgrowths, if you will, of the Enlightenment. True individualism, which leads to freedom, spontaneous order, and false individualism, which leads to collectivism and a controlled economy. For Hayek, it's essentially the British tradition versus the French tradition. True individualism includes thinkers such as Bernard Mandeville, David Hume, Edmund Burke, Adam Ferguson, Adam Smith, and Lord Acton, amongst others. False individualism, by contrast, derives from Cartesian rationalism and includes the encyclopedists and Rousseau, the physiocrats and Condorcet, amongst others. Now, of course, Hayek, who took on uh, British citizenship in 1938, is not simply catering to the sceptered Isle's historical prejudices against the French. For Hayek, there are certain English-speaking thinkers who fall into the French tradition. This is the case with Thomas Hobbes, Jeremy Bentham, and other philosophical radicals, along with those who supported the French Revolution, such as William Godwin, Richard Price, and Thomas Paine. And, of course, on the other side, there are certain French liberals, Anglophiles, all of them admittedly, whom Hayek deeply admired, and he would classify in the, in the English tradition, namely Montesquieu, Benjamin Constant, and Alexis de Tocqueville. So let's start by looking at some of the problems Hayek identifies with false individualism. This overly rationalistic and, and constructivist individualism. Well, for one, it tends to develop into the opposite of individualism, namely socialism or collectivism. For Hayek, the constructivist mentality is characterized by several interlocking factors. So number one is the belief in a socially autonomous human reason capable of designing civilization and culture. Number two is the radical rejection of tradition and conventional behavior. Number three is the tendency toward animistic or anthropomorphic thinking. And number four is the demand for the rational justification of all values. Now, according to Hayek, this cast of mind leads constructivists to, to attribute, perhaps implicitly, both the orderly structure apparent in society and the origin of social institutions to deliberate human invention or human design. 
unable to conceive of social order as the product of impersonal social forces, the constructivist, like the primitive, tends to ascribe all evident order to the design of an anthropomorphic entity, and is thereby frequently led, more or less consciously, to personify the concept of society, to impute blame, responsibility, and purposefulness to an abstract mental construct. Such naive or animistic thinking, Hyde claims, is characteristic of all schools of totalitarian, socialist, and interventionist political thought. Okay, so if these are some of the characteristics of false individualism, what are the essential characteristics of true individualism? Let's hear it in Hayek's own words. The first thing that should be said is that it is primarily a theory of society, an attempt to understand the forces which determine the social life of man, and only in the second instance, a set of political maxims derived from this view of society. This fact should by itself be sufficient to refute the silliest of the common misunderstandings, the belief that individualism postulates or bases its arguments on the assumption of the existence of isolated or self-contained individuals, instead of starting from men whose whole nature and character is determined by their existence in society. Okay, so the difference between this view, which accounts for most of the order which we find in, in human affairs as the unforeseen result of individual actions, and the other view, the view which traces all discoverable order to the deliberate design, to the deliberate design of human beings, is the first great contrast between true and false individualism. But this contrast simply illuminates an even deeper one, which is the relative value placed on reason in human affairs. Hayek's true individualism sees man as partly guided by reason, a reason which is always limited and, and imperfect. False individualism, by contrast, holds reason supreme, fully and equally available to all humans, and therefore everything that man achieves must be the direct result of, and therefore subject to, the control of individual reason. True individualism not only sees reason as fallible, but man himself as fallible, who improves only in so far as he's willing to submit himself to the discipline of civilization, a civilization that was not designed, but that has developed through the ages. And so the attitude of true individualism is fundamentally an attitude of humility and moderation toward the processes by which mankind has achieved things that have not been designed or understood by, uh, by any individual and are indeed greater than individual minds. Left free, this means, left free, people can achieve more than individual reason could possibly design or foresee. Now, as for the criticisms of individualism I listed at the outset, that, that uh, individualism is incompatible with community, that it glorifies selfishness, that it undermines virtue, well, the foregoing analysis has a way of addressing all of these. So first, let's, let's hear first another quote from Hayek to, to supplement this, this explanation. Hayek says, true individualism affirms the value of the life and all the common efforts of the small community and group, that it believes in local autonomy and voluntary associations, and that indeed its case rests largely on the contention that much for which the coercive action of the state is usually invoked can be done better by voluntary collaboration need not be stressed further. There can be no greater contrast to this than the false individualism which wants to dissolve all these smaller groups into atoms which have no cohesion other than the coercive rules imposed by the state and which tries to make all social ties prescriptive 
instead of using the state mainly as a protection of the individual against the arrogation of coercive powers by the smaller groups. Okay. So true individualism hardly presupposes isolated atomistic individuals. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's the overly rationalistic individualism, the false individualism, that exaggerates the power of man's reason, that lords it over society and moves individuals about according to some rational and yet fallible design. In the name of an over-exaggerated reason, false individualism would tear down traditions that it cannot understand and destroy communities that prove to be resistant to its will. True individualism, by contrast, gives individuals the space they need to assemble and form communities and traditions according to their own desires, which is to say, naturally. So, so much for the first criticism. As for the second criticism, the criticism that individualism glorifies selfishness, if true individualism advocates self-interest, it's not under the assumption that all people are, are selfish or selfish in the worst possible way, but rather that people ought to be allowed to follow their own desires, which may be noble or base. Nor does it even necessarily assert that each person knows his own best interest, although there is a greater chance that an individual has a better idea of what's good for him than some far-off bureaucrat does. The point, though, rather, is that nobody can know who has the best idea of one's interest. And so the only way to find out is through a social process in which each person is free to figure that out for himself. And the irony, once again, is that it is false individualism, the, the overly rationalistic individualism that would provoke the worst forms of selfishness. Why? Well, power would have to be centralized to an enormous degree in order to impose a quote-unquote better order on society. And I see no reason to believe that someone or a group of people invested with such awesome power would not be corrupted by it. As Thomas Jefferson said in his first inaugural address, Sometimes it is said that man cannot be trusted with the government of himself. Can he then be trusted with the government of others? Or have we found angels in the form of kings to govern him? Well, we most assuredly have not found such angels. Such awesome power would likely turn the ruler or rulers into a tyrant. The tyrant would have free reign to enslave society in the interest of his own base selfishness. And what about the, the people living under the tyrant? Well, they too would become more atomized and selfish in the worst way. And why is that? The tyrant can maintain power only by preventing people from congregating and, and speaking openly. He must keep people atomized through the help of informants, secret police, ample amounts of force and coercion. Fear would spread through an increasingly totalitarian society. Erstwhile friends, neighbors, and even family would begin to mistrust one another. Everyone becomes a potential informant. And it is precisely this fact that makes family and the people you're supposed to be able to trust the most dangerous. In such an atmosphere, mere survival is the name of the game, and one survives by keeping his head down, avoiding others, and tending only to his own most basic needs. Because anything more would be suspicious. And that brings us to the third criticism of individualism and individual liberty, that it undermines virtue. Well, it may in fact be precisely the opposite. 
Virtue, to begin with, cannot be coerced. In order for it to be a virtuous act, it must be freely chosen. For it to be freely chosen, there must be the possibility that one could opt for the vicious act instead of the virtuous act. And indeed, some people will. Limiting the power of the state will not necessarily make all people good, but it will protect those who choose to pursue virtue from those who do not, and that applies to both citizens and rulers. Once again, we see that the criticisms of individualism apply only to false individualism, and not to the true individualism advocated by Hayek. False individualism, by placing power in an allegedly rational and all-knowing individual or group, ends up undermining the personal responsibility of everyone else, and it does so under the most specious of pretenses that we, quote-unquote, we as a society must stand together, when in reality, all such rhetoric means is that dissenters are antisocial and must be brought in line. Rather, it is true individualism that allows for the building of communities and common projects initiated from the ground up and not imposed top down. It is true individualism that can lead us away from base selfishness. And therefore, it is true individualism and only true individualism that permits us freely to pursue the virtue and excellence upon which a free and prosperous society depends. And that's what Hayek would say. Hey everyone, thanks for checking out this video. You know, the thing that I love about Hayek is he's so rich in so many different ideas. And what we covered in this video here also points to a lot of other interesting ideas from Hayek that we've covered in some other videos. So if you enjoyed this video, I think you might also find interesting a couple of our other ones, such as morality in the market, and the true meaning of liberty. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. Thanks.